Steve, what is the standard model of fundamental physics explaining all these particles? The uh, theory of elementary particles that we have now uh, involves four kinds of force in the universe. Uh, there's electromagnetism, which is fairly familiar. People are familiar with the magnetic fields produced by magnets and electric forces that drive currents in wires. There's uh, gravitation, which is very familiar. That's the first known of all the forces. It cause, causes apples to fall to the <laughs> ground and the moon to stay in its orbit. And then there are two other kinds of force that are much less familiar because they own, they're short range. Unlike electromagnetism and gravity, they don't extend out to great distances. Uh, and they all really only operate inside the nucleus of the atom. They're called imaginatively <laughs> weak nuclear forces and strong nuclear forces. Right. The strong nuclear forces hold the particles together inside the nucleus. They also hold the particles together inside the particles inside the <laughs> nucleus, the, the so-called quarks. And the weak nuclear forces are too weak to hold anything together, but they cause transitions, transmutations. They allow protons in the nucleus to turn into neutrons and vice versa. So they're responsible for... Radioactive decay, yeah, for example. The, the, the main... The first discovered kind of radioactivity called beta radioactivity and the first step in the chain of nuclear reactions that provides the heat to the stars is, is a weak interaction. Uh, there are, uh, for many years, Einstein tried to unify the theory of electromagnetism and gravitation because those were the two forces that are long range, that are familiar in everyday life and that he knew about as a young man. <laughs> And it didn't work. I mean, that was the unified field theory that was a favorite subject of sun, Sunday supplements. and yeah. never worked out. Uh, in uh, the 1960s, we realized that there is a, a, a fundamental unity between the electromagnetic force and not the gravitational, but the weak nuclear force, that they are really part of the same complex of forces and when you say we, you really mean we, because that's what you did personally. I did it, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, important uh, contributions were made by other people, too. Uh, uh, Sheldon Glashow, Abdus Salam, Gerard Atoft, uh, and so on. Uh, the, uh, so I said we. <laughs> um, the... Uh, there is a deep relation between them, which is not apparent when you study them. Because, as I said, the weak nuclear force has short range. The electromagnetic force extends out to very large ranges. It turns out that that's somewhat of an environmental accident, that that's true in our present universe, uh, that because of the cooling of the universe, the symmetry that unifies the weak and the electromagnetic forces has been broken. Which means, it doesn't mean that it's not there. It is there, but it's there in a much more subtle way, which allows us to make predictions, do calculations, but doesn't say that they look the same. This phenomenon of broken symmetry, uh, that you can, you can have a theory in which different elements, like for example, in the standard theory of the weak and the electromagnetic interactions, the electron and neutrino, are treated in the underlying theory as if they're indistinguishable. As whatever, If you write down the equations and everywhere where you have the electron, you replace it by the neutrino and vice versa, the equations retain the same form. So the equations exhibit the symmetry perfectly. It's not an approximation. It's a perfect symmetry. But when you calculate the consequences of the equations, you find that you get two particles, one of which the electron has a mass, it has a certain weight, The ele not very large, but it still is a massive particle, the neutrino massless. And uh, so that the failure of symmetry comes through the solution of the equations. But if you added a high temperature, if you went back to when the universe was hot, then the two particles would behave exactly the same way. The it's a little bit like what which happens, unifies the yeah 
the theory. It's, it's a little bit like what happens uh, when uh, water freezes. Uh, originally, you have a glass of water. Every direction in the water is the same. Water, liquid water, has no sense of direction. Of course, it has a surface, but once you get inside the water, all directions are the same. But when it freezes, you get crystals of ice, and crystals have a definite sense of direction. The atoms are lined up that way, but they're not lined up that way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, the universe has frozen uh, in that sense, that the symmetries have been lost. Well, for, for broken symmetry to be so important in constructing the standard model which arrays the particles, symmetry itself must be some sort of a fundamental principle underlying how everything works. Yes. What, what, what is the, what can we say about the fundamental importance of symmetry in fundamental physics? We uh, have few things to go on in trying to construct our most fundamental theories. Uh, because the mathematics is so far removed from our everyday intuition. We need physical principles that uh, we then turn into mathematical equations and which we then use to do calculations. The deepest principles that we have been able to discover are principles of symmetry. Symmetry principles are statements that when you change your point of view about something, uh, it, the thing doesn't change. Um, it, it, for example, if you have a sphere that has a high degree of symmetry, you look at it from different directions, it looks same. the same. If you have a cube, it has a certain symmetry, but it's a lower degree. If you look at it from six different directions, it looks the same, but if you look at it from a slanted direction, it doesn't look the same. Um, those are the symmetries of things. Now, symmetries of things, like cubes or spheres, that's an old story. That goes way back in the history of natural philosophy. Uh, the great discovery of the 20th century was the importance of the symmetries, not of things, but of laws. That is, when you, the laws of nature are indifferent to, for example, what, how you orient your laboratory. That's a symmetry called rotational invariance, that the laws of nature have no inbuilt sense of direction. Uh, that's not so obvious. Uh, it wasn't obvious to Aristotle, who thought that things naturally fall down. Uh, well, earth and water fall down, air and fire naturally fall up, go up. Um, but through the work of Newton, it was realized that all directions in space are the same, and the apparent discrepancy is due to the fact that there's a certain large body called the Earth there. And, uh, so, uh, but the Newtonian laws of motion exhibit that symmetry. Well, that was regarded until the 20th century as, as more or less uh, a nice thing, but not terribly important. The important thing was the dynamics, the forces. It was Einstein, really, who introduced symmetry as a fundamental ingredient as, as part of the laws mm. of nature. And the symmetry that he particularly uh, implemented was the symmetry that tells you that the laws of nature don't depend on the speed of the observer or the direction in which the observer is moving. He made that a fundamental principle in his special theory of relativity. And he set the 20th century on a path of regarding symmetry as the most reliable foundation for a physical theory. And what's remarkable is where he did it in the macroscopic universe, you're now finding symmetry of laws in fundamental yes. physics to be equally as uh, critical. But unlike, unlike Einstein's uh, symmetry, uh, the symmetry between different ways of, uh, that the observer might be moving, uh, we have to deal with symmetries which are broken which uh, where the symmetry is there in the equations, but the solution of the equations don't exhibit the symmetry. And that makes it much harder because they're not, they're not apparent, just as the symmetry between the weak 
and the electromagnetic interactions or the symmetry between the electron and the neutrino were not apparent but have to be inferred in very indirect ways. So the great challenge for the future may be to now bring gravity into the unity uh, between all the forces. Yes, but unfortunately, uh, we have not yet found a symmetry principle that would govern that unification. And we are, um, uh, you know, we're, we're really stumbling in the dark at present in trying to make the next big step. But theoretically, in the very, very early universe, when the heat was at whatever number of trillion degrees, that there was this unity? Uh, well, we hope so. Uh, gravity is, is really very different from the other three forces. Uh, it's not carried by the same kind of particle. Uh, there's a a precise way of describing the difference uh, it has to do with the spin of the particle that carries the force mm -hmm. the strong weak and electromagnetic forces are all carried by particles uh, that is the the energy and momentum is transmitted by a particle traveling from one place to another and the particles that transmit the force have a certain spin uh, I won't say what that spin is, a certain quantity of spin. The gravitational force is carried by a particle with twice the spin, called the graviton. <laughs> and it may not sound like a big difference, but it's an, it's an enormous difference mathematically, and that's what has kept us from unifying gravity with the other I'll, forces. I'll trust you on that one. All right. <laughs> it's a big difference.